Well, Emily, welcome back to round two. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, everybody had all caught up with what happened in the last uh, 10 months between when you left Organize 365 and when you found yourself working for this IT company in Akron, Ohio. And now I really, um, along the way, at different points, you would message me or you would call me and you'd say, oh my goodness, I'm so glad I'm organized. I'm so glad I'm organized. And for me, I always thought you were an organized person um, and you were, but you got even more organized while you worked for Organize 365 because I mean, mm -hmm. you had to listen to every podcast episode and you mm -hmm. reorganized all the dashboards because you created all those first. Mm -hmm. um, and then moving from working at home to working at Firestone and then working at all these other places, you continue to reorganize yourself throughout this year. So I want to give you plenty of time to talk about how you kept reorganizing yourself. And I personally have always found that when I'm in transition, like as I'm starting this PhD, I am reorganizing all the time. And part of that reorganizing a fairly organized house is the processing through of the change. Like the processing through of working mm -hmm. from home to working in a corporate and then being an entrepreneur again. And then back to, you know, like just mm -hmm. every time I just kind of go through that. And I think that this is very normal and this is not talked about. The act, the physical act of organizing is a physical way to process through a mental and emotional change or transition in your life. Mm. And I think that's why, you know, you nest before you have a baby. You clear mm. out everything before a move. Yes, you have to physically move mm. the stuff, but there's more to it. If it was just about moving stuff, we would just buy boxes and move it all. That's not what we do. So mm -hmm. I'd like to turn the microphone back over to you and just kind of talk about, you know, as you went through these different jobs, as the, these different periods of time, how was your organization? What did you do organizationally? So I think the key sum up to go to the end to bring it back to the beginning and carry you to the end is that I live a proactive life not a reactive life and that is manifest in many ways and I think you know I I just always want to be so intentional about sharing with you because you've been so generous with me not just you know when I worked for you with the job but with the organizational materials, you know, so if we wanted Sunday baskets or we wanted, um, slash pockets or whatever, you know, we had an employee discount and I'm your sister. So you gave me lots of things nicely. <laughs> I'm like, Oh boy, now I got to buy my own <laughs> notepads. Um, but you know, I only use organized 365, uh, notepads and I use them for everything. And I have them in every room of my house and I only use organized 365 pens. And now I should just throw the rest of them away because I'm always like, oh, there's, there isn't one in this drawer. There's 10 other ones, but it's not an organized 365 pen. So I go into my office and look in there. Oh no. Okay. There's gotta be one in the bedroom. Like I just reject all of their pens. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and so I think, you know, when I worked for you, kind of take for granted that like, well, this is how we are organized. You know, we, we do, we're going to have a Kentucky Derby party. We make a slash bracket for that, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so, you know, I was sharing with you on Friday night about how I use my Sunday basket when I go to my appointments. And so I have my pad folio, of, you know, questions I'm going to ask the potential client. I have my binder that has all my tabs of here's our services and information about our chambers and things I might need. And then I put my laptop in there and I carry that every day, all day, wherever I go. And so, um, you know, I can be very detailed about how each one of those phases look differently, but it's always using the tools of Organize 365 in whatever capacity. So when I went to Firestone, um, I mentioned that I leveled up my wardrobe. And so one thing that I did that, um, you know, you always talk about is putting my clothes out the night before. And so I would make sure, you know, I had my underpants and I had what jewelry I was going to wear. And because I was being really intentional about not wearing the same jewelry every day or not wearing the same shoes. Like I wanted to have a different look every day and very well put together. So I would lay my clothes out the night before and I would make my list, um, you know, on my organized 365 notepad of whatever it was that was going to happen that next day, whatever meetings I had, whatever, whoever I had, to, I do to do, to call, to go, and then whatever appointments are in whatever order. 
Um, and like I said, there were a lot of moving pieces to that job. So, you know, I'm used to, okay, it's organized 365. Here's the strategic marketing plan. Well, it's Firestone Country Club. Here's the strategic marketing plan. But also there's a whole big piece that at that time was the Bridgestone Invitational, which is its own whole thing that then there is also a team with Bridgestone that works on that, that I'm working with. And then also at Firestone, there is food and beverage needs a plan and they need menus and they need um, those menus to be printed and they need them also to be on the website. And then there's um, the pro shop and retail, you know, and so how are we going to work network with the pro shop and what they're doing and when their sales are and when their track man's coming and when the guy from Callaway is coming to do the fittings and promoting that and then membership how am I going to work with Angela to make sure she's getting members and there so there were six different departments that all had their own marketing and then also we had a website that was designed by corporate that I had no control over and I had to work with the team on that and we had social media that they kind of did but then I was kind of doing and they kind of had a plan and they wanted me to put together a plan which I did so there was just all oh, and then there was we had a PR company, and in addition to the PR company, I had a ton of local print and radio and TV that would reach out to me directly and say, hey, do you want to buy an ad or do you want to do an article or whatever? And so there was that whole piece, and that I did in a binder with green slash pockets, and that was one of the last ones because our PR firm was exceptional, and he was doing a great job. So I just kind of kept stacking those things up for when I was able to get through the training on all these programs, and I had a slash pocket for every program. So I can't remember what the thing, oh, Tableau was one, and that was how we tracked like all our stats and everything about membership and how much we sold in food and beverage and all those things. So Tableau had a blue slash pocket and all the training programs that I was learning, um, like there was an app we used to text our members that had its own way of doing it. I forget what that was called. So all of those had a blue slash pocket, um, all the departments. So food and beverage membership, they all had a orange slash pocket. And these are all in a portable Sunday basket under my desk. And I could grab whatever I needed for that day. And even when corporate wasn't there, I would usually work till 5.30 or 6 at least and sometimes later because I would also every day go through all my emails and make sure I had answered them or forwarded them or if they had sat there too long without a response, I was checking back to say, um, haven't heard anything on this. What are we going to do with this article for Arnold Palmer magazine? You know, are you handling it? Am I? Whatever. Um, and so when I did that, then before I left that night, I would stack up everything that I needed in the order that I would need it. So <clears throat> I had my list on top of here's what's going to happen the next day. And then if I had a meeting with the PR firm at 9 a.m., that was the first one. And then under there was our department head meeting and that slash pocket was under there and whatever additional things went with that was stacked in there too. So when I came in in the morning, I had my plan and I had my stack of everything that was going to go on. And then I had my portable Sunday basket under there housing everything else that wasn't in play that day. And then I also took, um, I took a portable Sunday basket back and forth. And I kind of have been doing that with this new job also, because in the beginning, you know, like I might need another couple labels for my slash pocket. So I'm bringing my label maker with me today, but I don't want to leave it there. So I'm bringing it back in my, you know, so I have one that I kind of use as my things I need for today, but only today. And then I have one that kind of stays. Um, and so that's kind of how I did it at Firestone. I'm trying to think if there was anything else um, with that job. So then, like I said, I had, you know, five feet by three feet worth of stuff I hauled out of there and brought home. And then I decided, okay, what do I need to keep from this job? You know, the, the paper he gave me and a couple other, you know, my offer letter and things like that, that I need to keep in a file and ditched everything else. And then went back to the beginning, like I said, of like, okay, where's my affirmations from? Do I want to go back to teaching? You know, what are we going to do? Um, and that, I, I wouldn't say this is necessarily the organization piece so much, except 
you know, I talked about previously in the podcast, how I spend this time between January 1st and my birthday, reorganizing my mind and my intentions. I forget what that quote is that, that I put on there from Kelsey Ballerini. It's like, be the, set your intentions and be the person you are becoming. And so I spend this six weeks kind of deciding who that person is, you know? And I feel like when I lost my job at Firestone, I kind of had like, that was inserted into my summer (laughs) as opposed to this part of time when I always do it. Um, And so there was that pulling all those things and then stacking those all up on a bench in my bedroom and going through, you know, okay, these things are related to teaching. These things are related to EMK Inc. These things are related to your job um, applications and things. And then deciding what do I want to work on first? What do I want to work on today? And then pulling that into play, whether that's, you know, I'm going to go through these things today on my bed and listen to instrumental praise and have my candle lit with Rocco. And that's what we're going to do today. And then keeping from that stack, whatever I wanted to keep, deciding what actions I wanted to take. Do I want to reach out to these business owners today to see if they want a strategic marketing plan? Am I going to, um, what is my social post going to be about my job search and EMK incorporated today, tomorrow, next week? Um, you know, and so that time was just kind of like presenting myself to the Lord to say, okay, here's where we've been, where you want me to go. Um, and then organizing my day, same, you know, so if in the morning I get invited to a networking group, I've got, you know, a slash pocket to keep whatever business cards I get from there in so that I can remember who's in that group until I get to connecting with them on LinkedIn. Um, now I'm going to meet with one of the neighbors to see if he wants me to organize his storage area. I've got his information, you know, and so I kind of use my portable Sunday basket in my list in that way too, of like, what are the top three things I want to get done today? Even if they're not related to each other, you know what I mean? Um, and always moving, um, the lady across the street, her name was Birdie, you know, always moving her things ahead. I did some things on eBay for her that I was always checking and stuff like that. So because there were so many different spokes of the wheel at that time, um, it was really keeping my calendar up to date, my to-do list up to date and also being proactive and intentional and not saying, well, I don't have a job and I don't have anybody I have to meet with today. So I guess I'll take a nap, you know, no, still working that nine to five of moving on to the, whatever the next thing is. You know, this is so, I, I just love listening to this. I'm like, oh yeah, I do that. I do that. I do that. I think that once you start externalizing your thoughts and eliminating a long running to-do list that at one point Mm -hmm. for me was literally eight pages in a legal pad. And -hmm. you start thinking in slash pockets. You can't stop thinking in slash pockets. Like once you started using slash pockets, you can never have enough slash pockets. Like you're, you're going to have like my PhD already fills five different Sunday baskets. I'm not sharing all Mm -hmm. that with you guys because everything has a color. Like every class has a color. There's a color for research. Then there's a color for research that I've actually published. And there's a color for research that I'm not sure if I'm going to use. That's three different colors. And I have three different classes. So it's six different baskets, six different colors. But whenever I see that color slash bucket, I know if it's a class that's to get me into a PhD Mm -hmm. or if it's me Mm -hmm. proactively already working on the PhD, I haven't even been accepted yet to do, but I'm gathering it. And literally nothing is on a list somewhere or in my email or on my computer. Like it's all very visual to me. And while maybe you don't want that many slash pockets, our lives are that complex. Mm-hmm. Like These are all of the things that are in process in my life. Mm-hmm. And if you can't see them, it doesn't mean they're not there. Mm-hmm. And when you can see them, And you don't rely on your brain to remind you or a list that's like a thousand items long to find the one that you're going to work want to work on today. Um, For me, at least, and maybe for you also, Emily, all the slash pockets are there. Like all the work is there. And it's kind of like, what do I want to do today? What is Mm -hmm. my energy for today? Okay. My energy is this. Oh, what are the slash pockets that relate to that? I grab those. And then I make like a daily list. Okay. These are a few things I'm going to get end of the day. 
what's my energy? What's the priority? Am I going to keep working on these? No. Okay. Then they go back in their homes and I pick out new ones. And mm -hmm. I do the same as you do. Um, I don't often share how much my using my work boxes and Sunday baskets has evolved because if you're brand new to the Sunday basket, I really don't want you to have more than just one box because you'll get way too overwhelmed. But at work, I have a Friday work box, which is like everything that is going on in Organize 365 at any one time. And then I have a portable that I put in there, whatever is going on this week that I am instrumental in. Mm. And then just like you on my desk, as I leave work every day, I put on my desk, the slash pockets in order of how mm -hmm. they're going to match the meetings that I have the next day. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is once you live your life this way, um, you just get so much more done and mm -hmm. you don't worry about things. You don't wake up in the mm -hmm. middle of the night wondering because you're already planned and you are, it's so easy to scrap one thing and start another one because your energy is different and still know that you're going to get it done because mm -hmm. all of the things are visually in front of you. So, um, yeah, I'm as far as work, I'm doing the exact same thing. Ooh. You know, organization is learnable skill, <laughs> but it's a skill that you carry with you. And so I go ahead and, and keep talking about how your organization has um, helped you through this season. But the question I have for you is, what was your organization like before Organize 365? What did you learn during mm. Organize 365? And then what are you taking with you after you've left Organize 365? Hmm. I don't remember. Oh, well, okay. A couple of things I've thought of while you're talking that I want to share real quick. I'll go back to that and kind of start from there. And then we'll get back to where I left off with organizing post Firestone. So number one, also during this time, while I'm reorganizing my plan that doesn't exist or whatever you want to call it, I'm getting medical bills, you know, and a ton of medical bills. I mean, you know, I had two different ambulance rides, two different companies, urgent care, and the hospital, and this doctor who came with that, and this pill, and I mean, I don't even know the names of these things, you know what I mean, or when, the, and I was, you know, unconscious practically, and so they're coming in, and so I do medical is red, and so I have, you know, here's my medical expenses for the year, once I've paid a bill completely, that goes in there, so I have it for my taxes, but in the meantime, I called every single one, one day I got them all laid out, and I had and I actually, when I was making those phone calls for you, I had someone ask me how to do this. And I thought, wow, I guess I never thought this is something you would have to explain, but here's how it works, you know, because you get those bills. And then you also get the thing from the insurance company saying what's covered or not covered. And half the time, you know, it's uh, this one says 465 and you only have a bill for 232 and then you're waiting and you don't know who's what, you know. And so I waited about 30 days and then I just set them all out like a puzzle piece and matched them all up best I could with what I did have of the puzzle. And then I called every single one and I said, uh, I was in the hospital. I've lost my job. I will pay you every cent, but right now I can only pay you $10 because I have about 80 of these bills and I owe $7,000. And some of them said, okay, we will um, make a note of it or we will put you on the list for financial assistance or whatever, or, well, that's not good enough. If you don't pay us, we're going to collections. And I said, well, that, it is what it is. I don't know what else you want me to tell you because I don't have it. And I just want to share real quickly, um, the biggest bill that was like $3,800 from the hospital I applied for the financial assistance and I made a note of who I talked to and what day that was on that bill. And time went by and I never heard anything back. And so I called back like 60 days later and I had submitted all the, you know, this is what I paid for my mortgage and all that stuff. And I said, I never heard anything. And I got a really nice girl and she was like, oh, oh, well, that's a, um, what did she call it? Not extenuating circumstance. It's a more extreme way of saying that. But she basically said it's a, hardship that hardship, you could yeah. not have over overcome and so um I will try and get it all covered for you and I was like really she's like yeah I, I think you qualify I was like oh my gosh and then a couple of weeks later I got a letter saying forgiven you don't and that was something I had said I trust you lord 
I, I don't know how this is all going to go, but I trust you. And I was like, wow, what a gift. So that went on the little note in the thing, you know, as a thank you during that time. So that's the medical bills. And then in Rocco's, you know, in the meantime, Rocco's dying. And so I've got, who am I going to call? What are their prices? What are they offering? What do people say about them? And so I had a slash pocket for him. He's purple. Um, and so you ask, you know, what was my organization like before Organized 365? Um, and I think I told you this funny story on Friday night. When I was little, I remember my bedroom was just an absolute blank show. I mean, there was just stuff everywhere, wall to wall, couldn't walk through the, you know, the floor. It was clothes everywhere, hangers and everything. I can like see it in my mind. And I remember mom saying, go clean your room. And I said, I can't. And she said, Lisa, go help her. And we did it. <laughs> and so that was my organization as a child. And then I remember learning, like when I graduated college and got my own home, when it's your home and not your parents, you know, your bedroom in your parents' house, then you make the effort and the choice to organize your space. And as an adult, I think I've been a pretty organized person. I definitely was a person with that long to-do list of like, you know, you've talked about, you're never going to get it all done. And so as opposed to the long to-do list, which I don't have either, actually, I have slash pockets. So like across from me on my desk, I have a portable Sunday basket. It has information because I do a Kentucky Derby party every year. I have a slash pocket for that. So I remember how much food and whatever I did. Um, I'm going to join Fairlawn Country Club eventually. So I've got that. I'm manifesting that in my Sunday basket. I've got a wish list. So that's kind of my only thing that's really like a to-do list is this wish list, things I want to accomplish or fix in my house or whatever that has a slash pocket. And then there's a separate one for painting because I have a couple painting projects that I want to keep track of how much this person said they would charge or that person or what colors or whatever. So I put my painting separate. And then I had someone come and give me a quote for New Windows, $10,000. So I'm leaving that here and all the other companies um, that I want to call and get a quote from. So that's my little Sunday basket here. And I pulled out that wish list to start my new year planning along with last year's calendar and that thing with all the thank yous and all my journaling that I had done last year and all of that kind of is in one category. Um, and then I do my bills in a Sunday basket too. So every bill has a slash pocket and it has, you know, if it's due on the first, it says one mortgage. If it's due on the 14th, it's 14 Dominion East Ohio so that I have them in order of when oh, they're due. I love that. Okay. Oh, I love that. So I have in my Sunday basket, just the green slash pocket for bill pay. And I tell you what, it's like getting a root canal every single week. I'm like, and I don't even have that many bills. Almost everything is automatically paid. Mm -hmm. But every Sunday I'm like, where does our money go? What is going on now? Mm -hmm. I am going to do that. Emily, I don't, Yay! Use my, I don't use my green set of slash pockets for anything because I used to use it for the LLC, but now it's a whole other thing. I, I am going to do that. I'm going to set it up for the bills are due the first week of the month, second week of the month, third week of the month, fourth week of the month. And if there is a fifth week or taxes or whatever. Oh my gosh. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. Just thought I, it's a game changer. Game. Yay. I taught you something. But Yay. here's the thing. It is all about reducing the mental load. Like mm -hmm. even though I have slash pockets in that bill slash pocket, it's too general for me. Um, and so I'm constantly rethinking things that I've already thought through. I, oh my gosh, I love the idea where I'm just going to grab bill pocket week one of bills on Sunday, instead of thinking about the whole month, every single Sunday, because you do have to look at your money all the time, <laughs> all the time. unless you're independently wealthy. Like I don't right. know many people who literally just don't even look at their money ever. Um, so that is so helpful. And whenever I get to a point where I'm overthinking things or wondering if I've done something or, or forgetting something that I would have in the past put on a never ending to-do list, I come mm -hmm. up with a visual solution and then a cadence to which you, you um, check that slash pocket, which it is so, it was so interesting for me to listen to how you, in a matter of weeks, pretty much slash pocketed it up a whole entire brand new marketing department that didn't even exist at Firestone. Like that is amazing. 
Um, mm -hmm. These systems, once you learn the organization and you start thinking this way, like this is just how you think. And mm -hmm. it is, it's amazing. Like it's a yeah. skill that you learn that you carry with you. Like, I don't even know how you would approach a brand new job that doesn't even exist in such a complex organization, non without the physicalness of slash pockets. Mm -hmm. Like if it's Agreed. all just digital and in your head, like, and it's especially so because my workspace was not that big. I mean, I couldn't right. have done it in piles. You know what I mean? Right. There wasn't enough room. Um, so real quick, there's more to the bill pay. I have a clipboard that has my monthly bills. I think you do this too. I think daddy taught us this. And so it matches the slash pockets. So on the left is one mortgage, the amount, and then a space to say check or maybe this month I paid an extra $15. I write how much I actually paid check mark. And then, you know, and it goes down. And so I check it off when I pay it. And then I also go back through throughout the month and I keep my receipts and I go through about once a week and double check that that bar really only took a $5 tip instead of a $15 tip, which has actually happened before. Um, to make sure that they've all cleared so that I know what my bank balance is, is really my bank balance. And then I, once my bill that I paid has cleared, I will highlight it in pink or yellow. So I know, okay, it's been paid, it's been received. And also I keep my paid bill where I also write, it was 135, but I paid 150 and the date in my slash pocket. So that then when the next bill comes, I check and say, did they get 150 and 19 cents? Yes. Okay. I can throw this one away and now I have the new one. And then, so that's how those slash pockets work. Um, and they're color coded. So um, credit cards are orange, mortgage is green, medical is red. I can't remember the rest of them, but they, but they're color coded based on what type of bill it is as well. So that's my bill pay. Um and, you know, other than those things I've shared, I couldn't tell you what my life was like before Organized 365 because I'm so used to it now. So it's like, you know, when, like, for example, the funeral home yesterday had been remodeled since the last time I had been there. And once you walk in and it's been remodeled, you can't remember what it used to look like. You know what I mean? Before you walk in, you're like, oh, it's going to be mauve chairs over here. I, ivory table here and then you walk in and it's got like a fountain in the front and you're like oh geez and you completely forget the mob chairs and the ivory table you know what I mean and so I, I couldn't tell you what my life was like before but I will tell you I don't have a lot of lists and the other thing I do is sync my slash pockets as far as my money and my goals with my calendar so like when I do pay my bills through the next you know I have paid everything until I get paid this coming Friday I move pay your bills on my calendar to Friday, unless there isn't a bill due till the following Monday, then I'll move that task to the following Monday. And I know, okay, this is when I'm going to do that task of paying bills. And I need to do it that day because something's due. Um, the painting, Bernard was going to come and paint my garage ceiling, but I guess you can't paint if it's under 52 degrees outside or something, the paint doesn't dry right. And so I said, okay, so I moved him to... March 1st, thinking maybe it'll be 52 degrees on March 1st. And then I know, okay, I'm going to need to have $100, $200 to pay Bernard that. So then I'm keeping in mind, okay, in March, he's going to paint my garage ceiling. In April, I want the guy to come and do my landscaping. And that's going to be probably $1,000. So I'm planning also my budgeting of my wishes and my goals on my calendar. And then I can grab my slash pocket when that time comes. Great. Awesome. Love it. And I think, you know, as far as, you know, I got my job with um, Mike and I was doing that for him and I used Slash Pockets for that. So we had, again, he had, I, I put together a strategic marketing plan for him where the first thing we were going to do was put together the website that he didn't want to buy. So that, that meant the whole thing wasn't going to work, Mike. <laughs> um, we had Amazon uh, storefront that we needed to upgrade, and that was going to be with a company called Charmac. So I had Charmac at a slash pocket. We had um, a supplier who was dealing with the catnip um, 
people we were sourcing from. I had a slash pocket for him, you know, so everything in that strategic marketing plan had a slash pocket for, so when I'm having a meeting with Bob from this company, I've got his slash pocket and I can pull everything out and remember, oh, that's right. We left off here, here, and here. I need to answer this, this, and this, because that's what where we left off on these notes from the last meeting. And then I kept all those things and all that documentation. I had a binder too, which I use the sheet protectors for, again, start with the offer letter, job description, um, the new new um, employee orientation information. He had done some work like you did with brand builders where he had like his avatar and stuff like that. I put that in there, you know, one, one page facing one page in this sheet protector. So it goes like that. Um, and I kept all those things for like six weeks after I left him, just in case he tried to dispute or whatever. Um, which would be very hard to do because I'm a lot more like an attorney than people realize <laughs> because I have all that documentation. And then I have a binder. I think I mentioned that I have a binder now at this job where it has, um, I had a big training on how to enter my time. We have a thing called ConnectWise where you put in your time every day of, so they know like, okay, we got this account. It actually took us 18 hours from when we first called them. They know, you know, how much time was invested in every activity. Um, and so there's some information on how to do that. And then uh, some information on training, you know, different things about the products and services that we sell so that I could easily reference that. Some uh, sell sheets about the different services we have. And then I have a slash pocket for, we're in four chambers, a sales and marketing group and a women's group called Athena Akron, which is exceptional. If your town has a thing called Athena, that's a women's group. It's a part of an international organization, and I highly recommend these are a player, one percenter women in Athena Akron. So I have, and those are all different colors. So Greater Akron Chamber is orange, Kent Chamber is blue. Each one has a different color. And um, so I have all the information of all the events for those chambers, or each chamber has different offerings. So I want to make sure that we get the member to member discount in the Greater Akron Chamber listing on their website. And we're going to do an email blast for Kent. So all those things are in those slash pockets for each group. So if I'm going to meet with Camelia at Kaiga Falls, I pull her slash pocket and go there. So that's all in my binder for the job I have now. Okay. This is amazing. And uh, we're both obviously slash pocket converts. I know, I, I, I have a very vivid example that you will remember of what you and I looked like before slash buckets. Okay. Hmm. So how we organized something completely before slash buckets. Okay. And it was when dad got sick and passed away. I knew it. I knew it. It was a clipboard. Here it comes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So when dad got sick and passed away, it was a nine month experience, multiple hospital stays. You would be the first line of defense. I would do the calling the hospital bills. Like you had just said, and, um, we were, I don't even know if we were power of healthcare that really weren't medical decisions to make because we knew ultimately he was going to pass away. It wasn't, and yes, we were, we were okay. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, um, it wasn't something where like, if you picked a different medication or a different trial, he wasn't right. going to pass away. We knew, right. we knew he was going to pass away. We just didn't know how long he would be sick before he passed away. Right. So, um, and you, you primary were the primary power of healthcare. Like you took over healthcare cause you were in the city and mm -hmm. I would just get in the car and I would come up and then I would stay at the house. And so I would stay at the house. And so I was already processing through whether it was six weeks or six years, eventually we were going to have to sell this family home. Mm -hmm. And so I was already thinking about that. And I was making list upon list upon list. And at that time mm -hmm. it was on a yellow legal pad. I remember interesting, it. I can interesting see it in my mind. I have all these legal pads. I don't use anymore because I too use the organized 365. It's like half the size of a uh, eight and a half yeah. by 11 sheet of paper. So I grabbed my legal pads thinking, Ooh, I'll use those for my PhD. No, no. You could just recycle them because I can yeah. only write on little piece of paper now. But at that time I didn't have slash pockets. It was before organized 365. And the only way I knew how to organize my life was to make list upon list upon list. So mm -hmm. I had a legal pad just devoted to dad and the house and all the things I knew we were going to have to do. And of course I bought a book about how to settle mm -hmm. an estate uh, quite a bit before he passed. Luckily, because we did a couple of strategic things in his last months of life that saved us a lot in doing the um, 
and doing the estate. So I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you were grateful that I had bought that book and did some of those things mm -hmm. before he passed away. But also mm -hmm. uh, you did not want to admit he was going to pass away and that we were going to right. have to deal with this. Correct. And so anytime that I was proactive and knew what was coming or that we needed to at least do everything we possibly could, you're like, stop it. I, don't know. I was mad. It's not going to happen. I was like, no, right. it is happening. I, I and we're a, dealing with it. I had a really big love affair with denial. Oh my gosh. Oh, we were dancing all day and all night. <laughs> so because neither of us had slash pockets and I don't know as slash pockets would have necessarily made this better, but this is, this is how we yes, were before have. slash pockets. For sure. You were completely in denial. As soon as dad would yeah. get out of the hospital, you're totally. like rainbows and unicorns. We're going to be fine. I'm like, yep. we're not fine. Everything's we just fine. got a stay of execution. Like I just have more time to prepare now. And you're like, no, right. no, it's all fine. It's going to be great. And so we were doing this dance back and forth. And then obviously he got to the point where he was so sick that he was sent home on hospice. And then we had luckily those couple of days with him. Um, and I was like, okay, well, I mean, we're in hospice. It does not, this, we know how this ends. And so I, the way I was able to take control, and often I find that organization is you're trying to get control on something you do not have control over. Like mm -hmm. that is, that is what organization often is, at least mm -hmm. for me. And so I would make list after list after list. So I had a legal pad for the estate. I had a legal pad for mm -hmm. selling the house. I had a legal pad for the funeral. In my defense, these things were going to happen in rapid, rapid succession. We had to do them. Mm -hmm. In your defense, you lived in the city and you were not moving as fast as I was in the amount that needed to be done in the timeline it needed to be done because you were in the city and like, what, what, what. Um, and so I don't, dad had passed. We had done the funeral arrangements. I think it was the day before the funeral though. And our family members were there at the house. And they were saying what they wanted and we had not gone through and decided what we wanted, but they were already saying what they wanted. And I went back in my bedroom and I came into the living room with the yellow legal pad in my hand. And you were like, I'm out of here. And you got up and nope. you were like, Gone. I said, not today. Yeah. And you left. And I was like, but we need to do these things. You're like, see ya. And you were like incommunicado. You went back to your yeah. home and we saw each other the next day. And I was like, was okay. Over but I had this list and like, these things have to be done before tomorrow. And now mm -hmm. you're not talking to me. So am I doing mm -hmm. them? Do you have a say? Do you? And it, it was very, um, it was very hard because mm -hmm. we were both processing a loss in a mm -hmm. different way, in a different timetable with mm -hmm. different expectations and different, um, you know, the estate was insolvent, meaning that all the bills that were to be paid. We're not all going to be paid. So we did not have the luxury of, well, there's plenty of money. So we'll just leave the house there for six more months and then we'll sell it. You do realize no. when somebody passes away, you still have to pay the insurance, the mortgage, all, like there wasn't enough money to keep this thing going. Like going. it had to be decided. Mm -hmm. um, so we were up against that as well. And I, I know people who paid the mortgage and the insurance for years before they sell mm -hmm. the family home. Sorry, everyone about Hunter. We're recording this at home. Um, so like you said, slash pockets would have made it better. I, I think slash pockets would have made it better in that as dad got sick nine months in the first time he was sick, I did fully take over power of healthcare and start paying the bills because we didn't know he was going to get better and then sick and then better than sick. And when mm -hmm. I did that the first time, I could have set up a Sunday basket for him mm -hmm. and I could have set up the medical and financial binder. And then we would have been working on those mm -hmm. playbooks the entire nine months. And when the inevitable mm -hmm. happened, we would have been on the same page mm -hmm. and it would have been very factual versus my to-do list that I'm shoving on you and that you're trying to resist. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that would have been very helpful. Um, also something our father did that many, many, many people do when they get overwhelmed, when they run out of money and when they are headed towards their passing is they stop opening their mail. Mm -hmm. They do it all the time. And I can't even tell you how many houses I've been in where people just stop opening their mail. And so there's often a huge backlog of mail that just needs to be opened to even figure out where you are in the financial mm -hmm. picture for someone who is in the process of leaving. And so I do think that these organizational systems and structures, they give you a neutral playing ground. They give you a tactile slash pocket printed out pieces of paper to talk about, decide, make visible the invisible work that you're doing. 
um, organize you through unexpected events and transitions as much as mm -hmm. optimizing your performance. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, that, that is exactly what you and I were like before organized 365. Hmm. Well, that's mm -hmm. interesting. It's interesting that you kept the goldenrod, um, legal pads because <laughs> yeah, you have had a terrible relationship with goldenrod legal pads since your childhood. <laughs> I, I would never want, I would burn them all in the fireplace and say a prayer. Um, <laughs> But I think because, and I distinctly remember that day when I said, yeah. nope, done. I'm done with yeah. your legal pads. Yes. Um, I never want to see another goldenrod legal pad personally myself because of that. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting you brought up that story. And I think it's helpful to share, although I particularly talk a lot about losing daddy. And I know on this podcast, we've talked about it a lot. I think it's helpful for people to know what we've learned. And so last night I was sharing that exact story with one of my girlfriends that was over for girls night because yesterday we buried Dory. And so I invited his, her uh, husband over to have lasagna with us and just a distraction or whatever. Cause it was after the funeral. And he said, no, but if you guys want to come over, you can. So we went over there and sat with him and watched a little bit of the football and, you know, just listened to him talk. And he had gotten the ashes back already, which I thought it took a while to get those. I know it took a while to get Rocco's, but I was surprised they, cause that's a process too. I was surprised they sent him home that day. I mean, she died on Monday, buried her yesterday and he already has the ashes back. It's like, boom, 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 boom. You know what I mean? Um, and he mentioned that his sister had come back after the funeral and wanted to start going through her clothes. And I said, I would shoot her. I mean, that is so rude and insensitive. I mean, because in this case, it's his house. It's his wife's stuff. There's no rush. That is greedy and selfish and mean to do after he's just buried his wife. You selfish. I was so mad when we got back. I told the girls and I said, you know, when my dad died, uh, my I was working and my sister would go through the house every day. And anytime anything sensitive would come up, she'd be like, OK, we're putting it on crying day. Don't don't. I can't lose you. Just come back. Come back. OK, we're back to silverware, you know, or whatever it is. I said, and I was allowed to cry on crying day. And I told her what that was like. And I said, and then when my girlfriend Shannon's dad died, she started doing the same thing my sister did because she had to sell the house. And so every time we went over there, she would say, do you need aluminum foil? Do you need Tupperware? Do you want these uh, cookie tins? And I was like, no, I don't want any of this stuff. And quit talking about it and quit asking me like, because it took me right back to that feeling again. And I didn't mean to be insensitive to her, but I did not want to feel that way. And so I was telling my friend, Julie, last night, I said, um, people do it different. You either are, okay, I'm going to be constructive with this grief and I'm going to work through the things because that's going to help me feel like I can control and move on and be productive, or you don't want to do that. And you want to feel and look through the pictures and listen to the songs and tell the stories. And there really isn't a lot in between. You're either one or you're the other. And when you're doing it together with someone who's opposite, it's hard. And being aware of that helps, you know? And so maybe she could have waited a couple of days to suggest that whenever you're ready, I could help you with the clothes instead of like, we should do it right now, you know? Um, and so I think yeah. just being sensitive on both sides of why is this person motivated? We didn't have the money. Okay, we just got to do it. Or- yeah okay, this person, and you did a great job of being like, okay, I know Emily is bullet holes all through her body right now. So I'm just going to make sure there's a lot of towels under there to mop up the blood. And you know what I mean? And just kind of tread lightly and little eggshells everywhere. Um, so anyway, I just the think it's interesting that you brought that up because it's important. Yeah. Let me, um, if you haven't listened to that podcast, I think it is, um, We'll have to find it. I know one of them is pretty old. It's called what to save when a loved one passes. Mm, it's not one. the story of our, of losing our dad, but at that time, it's like, you know, what I have saved as each grandparent has passed and, mm -hmm. and our parents and how I am very purposeful in what I save. Mm -hmm. So if, if this is striking you and you are like, could you give us the cliff notes? Here are the cliff notes of what we did. Uh, I took all of the paperwork, the file work, everything home, and I settled the estate in Cincinnati. It took like nine months. If you have, here's a little tip for you. 
Do not, I repeat, do not write your will so that there are two or three executors. If you're like, oh, I'm going to give it to all of my children, don't do that. Because what happens is then Emily and I would have had to have signed every single check and paper together. Two does not mean either or, it means both only, just FYI. So name a primary and then a secondary. Yes, Emily. But I will say the reason daddy did that was so that the, neither one of us would ever feel that he had chosen one of us over the other. He knew that we would figure it out and one of us would take responsibility and that it would probably be you, but he didn't want that to be something that he had assigned to you that I would ever feel bitter or resentful or whatever against you about. I know that's why he did that. He never told me, but I know for sure that's why he did that. That's great. It involved another lawyer and another <laughs> week and another day. And because of that, the second he passed away, we could do nothing. Mm -hmm. So until you meet with the lawyer that then establishes that one is going to be the executor over the other, all of the money and everything is frozen. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> great, not practical. <laughs> um, just saying. Um, and just have a conversation with, with your kids. Um, so that's number one. It's not the same in power of healthcare and power of healthcare, then everybody could do it. Same in power of attorney. Like if you have multiple powers of attorney, then they can all act. But as far as an executor, it is one or both, but not either or. So I brought all of this stuff to Cincinnati, the paperwork, because I knew I could take that off of you because I knew the actual selling of the house, which was in Akron, would have to fall on you. But I was only there for, um, I think, five days before I was going to leave. And there was an entire childhood family home full of stuff. Like our mother had moved, but there still was so much stuff in that house, like more than you could ever, ever mm -hmm. handle. And so I think I had three or I, I had four or five days. And so I divided up the house into categories and I would, the night before the morning of, I'd pull everything out of the cabinets or out of the drawers. And I put it all on the counters so that when you arrived, and, and often I go back to my kindergarten, preschool training. When I work with my children, my husband, my sister, whenever I'm like, okay, if I only have 30 minutes with them, 60 minutes with them, 90 minutes with them, like how long am I going to get Emily's attention before she's like, I'm out, which is realistic. Like, so I had everything. So it would go as fast as possible. And we would go into the room. Like we went into the family room. I pulled everything out. So you could see like everything in the room, give us a minute to look at everything in the room. And it was all ours. Like we were the only inheritance mm -hmm. people. So I was like, Emily, what in this room do you want? Color TV. Okay. What do I want? The, the couch. And then it was, what do you want? I want the button bear. Or if we ran into something that was emotional or mm -hmm. that we both wanted, I said, great. That goes on crying day. And crying I just day. labeled it crying day. So, it, and the things that ended up on crying day were like the little teddy bear that goes over a button on a shirt. That was like $1.50 at a flea market. That went on crying day. It did not matter the value of the thing in the mm -hmm. room. It was the emotional attachment to the item. And because so- it's priceless. Yes. And so we went through those rooms and we went through each room, I don't, maybe 15, 20 minutes. Like it was not an, a mm -hmm. lot of time because I did all the physical work. So you were like, I want this, I want this, I want this. I'm like checking it off on a list that I have. Mm -hmm. And then we would get to the point in that room that maybe we'd picked mm, 30 or 40% of what was in that room total. And we both would be like, I don't, don't really need, need anything plant. else. Right. I don't need anything else. And so then at that point it was, does anyone else in the family want the things that we had not wanted for ourselves? So we gave ourselves the permission to take a couple of weeks to figure out what we wanted first. Mm -hmm. And then we obviously opened it up to family. And then it went to sale after that. Just in case you think that we did this well. <laughs> I had a 40 foot U-Haul full of stuff that came to Cincinnati full. Mm -hmm. And I don't mm -hmm. even know how much stuff came to your house, Emily. I mean, it came and it filled our basement and it took me two years to process through what I actually wanted to keep and what I wanted to let go of. And I probably have gotten rid of 85% of that. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like I was just like, oh, I'm only taking these five things that I'm going. No, and it, a 40 foot U-Haul full of stuff came mm -hmm. to our house. Um mm -hmm. And I was still processing through a lot of that when I started Organize 365 in 2011, when I said that I didn't recognize my house because a lot of the stuff had gotten dropped off in 2009 was still there. And I just mm -hmm. hadn't even processed through it yet. Mm -hmm. um, so then on crying day, that was the day where we were like, we know we want to keep these things. We know we both want all of them. 
we know we're both not going to keep them all. So then it was like, okay, of all these really, really important things, which ones do you really want? Which ones do I really want? And then we employed what we had seen our dad do. <clears throat> so when my dad was, when I was 13, my dad lost his father, father. When I was seven, he lost his mother. He's the oldest of six children. And so I was in eighth grade and uh, Emily, you would have been nine at that time. I don't know how much you remember about that. I remember I learned how to pour beer out of a keg that day. Mm -hmm. So at grandpa's funeral, uh, dad showed me how to tip a glass and fill a, a, a plastic uh, cup with beer. He said, do this until nobody is in the line and then go watch all of your cousins and your sister. Mm -hmm. And so I was in charge of all the cousins and Emily. And um, I entertained them the entire time because we were in Cleveland, even though we lived in Akron, so we were close. We were in there a couple of days because the family had come together. The siblings had come together mm -hmm. from out of town. And we stayed at the Holiday Inn and we got to play in the pool. Do you remember that, oh, Emily? I don't remember that. Oh my gosh. I don't remember much of so it. So great. It's because you were younger, but we got to love swim at the Holiday yeah. Inn. And now I know, like thinking back, oh yeah, my dad was there with his siblings. Like they would come to the hotel where we would all swim. All the cousins mm. were swimming there because mm. they were still processing through this estate. And mm. a lot of the monetary value of the state had already been decided before my grandfather passed away, including the house had already been um, sold to a family member. So there wasn't a lot of monetary decisions that needed to be made, I don't believe. But there was a lot of memorable stuff and the kids were really young. So if I think about it, if I was 13, my dad was 34, 35, same age I was when he passed. And he was now the head of the household. Like his youngest brother was 19, 20 or 21. And now he's the head of the household. And so they were trying to figure out how to divide out the memorable things that were left amongst the family member who's, who lived all over the United States, not you know within four hours like you and I. And so I remember the day that they went into the living room, their version of crying day, and the doors were shut and I was to entertain any of the that. children. This was after the funeral. And um, I think I went to open the door and then I realized, oh, you don't do that. This is definitely like, all right, to the park we go. They'll figure out that right. we're not here. Um, so I, I just entertained it and they did this. They went in order. So dad was first. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want of what is left? And then they came up with these things that they all wanted. Um, the letter that my great grandfather had written my grandfather, everyone wanted the original of that. So they made a color copy. So that everybody has a copy. I have a copy in my office here. Um, it was on the day that my grandfather first went to college. His father wrote him a letter and everybody wanted a copy of that letter, but they also wanted the original my grandfather's violin. And there were just a series of things. And so um, they decided to, to make a shrine and that those six things became the shrine. And the purpose of that was that everybody would get something every six years. But the ultimate purpose of that was that this family of six siblings would have to come together at the holidays in order to exchange the items in the shrine. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they might just go to live their own lives and not not come back together and you wouldn't want to mail these items you would want to you would want to exchange them in person and mm -hmm. i just remember observing that and watching that and seeing how that played out like until i was in my 20s or 30s and then they kind of stopped getting together for all of the holidays but it really did it really did exactly what they intended it to do is it mm -hmm. kept those siblings together which is kind of what we started the last podcast episode about your relationship with your siblings is the longest relationship mm -hmm. you will ever have. It is mm -hmm. the longest relationship you will ever have. So mm -hmm. I think this is a good place to end this uh, second episode. I want to come back for a third one. If you'll have me, Emily, I love I'll have you. It. Okay. So we've talked about your dream job going bust and now transitioning into what is your next thing. And now we've talked about how the organization that we both have learned in the last 10 years have really helped us stay more organized in a non-organized world. I would love to really talk about something you and I were talking about privately about creating your unique purpose. And mm. I think that this is something we talk about a lot in Organize 365, but it's hard to quantify. And you might be listening thinking, well, if the dream job was Firestone and she's not there, how in the heck is she pursuing her unique purpose that she's created to do? So you'll have to come back for the next episode to hear about that. Stay tuned.